Hi, everyone. So a little bit of, of uh, background about Celsius Therapeutics. We're a small company uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're, we launched a year and a half ago out of Third Rock Ventures and Google Ventures and other investors. Uh, we are about 40 employees at the moment and growing fast. Uh, and the goal of the company is to discover new drugs for cancer and autoimmune diseases. Uh, my role in the company since day one and much before day one was to assemble the data science and CompBio and data engineering team uh, to uh, work on the genomic data that we use to uh, discover new drug targets. So um, to make new drugs, one needs to identify new drug targets and to do so at Celsius we're using the power of single cell sequencing and specifically single cell RNA-seq or transcriptome sequencing. Uh, to uh, identify new drug targets. And to uh, give a, a, a simpl simplified representation of what single cell RNA seq is, uh, 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 people often use this smoothie comparison where, uh, where if, you were, if you wanted to, see, to understand what are the fruits that are uh, uh, present in the smoothie, that would be very complicated. You would have a, really an average or uh, 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 av average representation of it, but the, the, the comparison with single cell sequencing is that we can identify each, each fruit that is present in it and uh, not just uh, what, what kind of fruit, but also their quantity and, and taste and, and so on. Uh, this is massive data and it also requires a lot of machine learning to make sense out of this data and I will uh, describe this in the next few slides. To give a more genomic representation of what single cell sequencing is, uh, we can compare it with, with bulk RNA-seq where one would uh, analyze the, the average of all the cell in a, in a specific uh, tissue sample. And since all these cells are, are mixed together and the nucleic acids are extracted from, from this mixture of cells, one cannot tell which cell each nucleic acid uh, came from. And so this, uh, when we have questions such as, uh, what, are, what, are the, what is the transcriptome of a minor cell population in the sample, such as immune cells, which are very important in cancer immunotherapy or autoimmune diseases, that would be very complicated to do with bulk RNA-seq. And conversely, if you wanted to distinguish differences in, in the, the proportions of these minor cell populations, it would be complicated as well. So with single cell RNA-seq, we use uh, several kinds of sequencing barcodes to be able to deconvolute not only each cell in a particular sample, but also uh, know which specific physical transcript each uh, sequencing read came from. And so that's, that's uh, uh, using sequencing barcodes again. So this enables such questions as to, to uh, quantify minor or all the cell populations in a particular sample. Uh, also understanding what is the, the heterogeneity within a tissue and, and the, 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 uh, the various states of these cells. So a, a T cell is not a T cell. It can, it can take many different shapes uh, or, or, or phenotypes, really. Uh, and we can also identify new cell types that might be involved in disease. So at Celsius, our approach has been to start from human patient samples uh, and, and, and large large numbers of human patient samples to truly understand how the disease, uh, what, what forms the disease takes and what could be causing the disease in, in, uh, in, in patients, not in animal models or in vitro models. Um, following this, this uh, collection of samples, we're performing single cell RNA-seq uh, to identify what rare cell types might be present. Uh, what are some, some variants or, or genes or, or cellular states that might be causing the disease, identify cell-cell interactions that are also causing the, the disease, and, and also importantly identify subsets of patients that, that might present various forms of, of the disease. As you might know, it's, it's not very complicated nowadays to generate single-cell RNA-seq data, but it's very complicated to generate good data. And there's a lot of know-how in the, the upstream uh, processes prior to, to uh, running the samples on the single cell RNA-seq platform. And there's a lot of know-how as well downstream to analyze those data. And I, I'll be going over why, uh, how we're uh, uh, analyzing these data. So briefly, using single cell RNA-seq data, we want to generate insights about this disease. Uh, and, and for that, we have developed a custom analysis pipeline that I will describe. 
uh, briefly to be able to uh, uh, assemble good data sets for understanding these diseases, one needs to analyze a lot of samples. And it's not enough to analyze just a, a dozen samples because that would not capture the true heterogeneity of the, of the disease. And so in our, what we call our sequencing campaigns, where we're thinking in terms of uh, hundreds of samples to, to capture the, the patient heterogeneity uh, for, for each disease that we're interested in. Uh, W these these uh, samples uh, uh, are well controlled with uh, a lot of annotation as to what, what kind of characteristics of the disease each patient has so that as to build a very uh, uh, extensive and well annotated data. And we have uh, multiple collaborations with both uh, uh, industry and academic partners to assemble these uh, or to collect these, these data, these, uh, these samples. Our plan, and this is already underway, is to collect thousands of samples over the next couple of years, and, and, and certainly well over a thousand patient samples over the next 12 months. So, so that's uh, a truly unprecedented uh, uh, data set, single cell RNA seq data set. So, what this translates to, and and the and really to understand the complexity of analyzing this data, one has to look at the numbers. So, we're, we're talking about thousands of uh, tissue samples, and for each sample, we're looking at thousands of cells, typically in the order of 10,000 cells. And as you know, the, the size of the transcriptome is about 20,000 genes. So that represents hundreds of billions of, of potential data points. So that is really the, the scale of the, the matrices that we're dealing with. Uh, and traditional analysis approaches cannot really deal with, with uh, data of this, this size. The the shape of the single cell RNA-seq data is, is a little bit particular because these data are extremely sparse. We're talking about 95% sparse matrices, so, so really compli com complicates the analysis. A brief point about the, the various things that need to fall into place to enable uh, this, this drug discovery uh, aspect. Of course, I've talked about clinical samples. These need to be well annotated and, and in large numbers. Uh, the technology to, to generate these data, the single cell side and also on the analysis side is, is, is complex and, and we've been working on, on optimizing these processes for the past couple of years. Uh, and to discover new drug targets, one has to also validate these, these, uh, these targets and so there's a, a large functional genomics effort at, at Celsius. So now switching gears a, a bit and talking about the analysis with established an analysis pipeline in AWS Cloud. We've uh, used uh, the, the uh, biotech blueprint uh, created by uh, Third Rock and AWS, and that really helped us tremendously at the beginning to jumpstart our, our analysis uh, or, or cloud environment. Uh, we've established a uh, analysis platform based on, on uh, EC2 nodes and, and uh, uh, using uh, tools such as Packer and Docker to encapsulate all our analysis uh, uh, steps or, or programs. Uh, and we're using Quilt for uh, these aspects of, of data versioning of being, being able to create packages of, of uh, uh, data and, re and retain consistency for, for each, each uh, version of the analysis. Going deeper in the analysis with, uh, for, for the analysis of the raw data, the raw sequencing data, we're using standard components uh, for alignment and expression quantification that are all packaged in a, in a uh, custom workflow that we've built uh, using directly AWS Batch. Uh, we've explored multiple tools that allow to, to run workflows such as uh, uh, Nextflow or Airflow and Cromwell and others, but really the, the, the time that we, we thought or we determined that the time that it took to um, uh, encapsulate all the analysis steps using those tools or using AWS Batch directly was, was almost equivalent and we had more control over the, 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 uh, the scheduling of the, all the steps of the analysis pipeline by, by using AWS Batch directly. And we've been fairly happy with our solution since then. Uh, downstream of the analysis, we are using also a variety of, of tools such as uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks and, and RStudio and, and 
uh, that are running on, on individual instances that are accessed by the, the analysts in the, in, in the team. So the challenges of the analysis of single cell data sets are, are numerous. First of all, there's, uh, when looking at the, these data, there's differences in, in the size of the, the, the individual cells that we're analyzing that have, uh, and the consequence of that is that the, the, the library complexity or the size of the sequencing library for each cell is, is uh, different and, and one needs to normalize for this. There's also important batch effects in, in single cell RNA-seq data that one needs to, to model and, and there are multiple other uh, challenges with, with this data such as when, when the cells are more or less uh, uh, viable, they, they, also, we, they also start to express multiple uh, genes that can confound the, the, the analysis. Uh, mRNA or like the messenger RNAs that we're primarily interested in really constitute one percent of the messenger or of the sorry of the RNAs in the cell, and so one can have a lot of uh, contaminations of, of other types of RNAs in the in the sequencing that also confound the analysis. Uh, as I've mentioned before, these data are very uh, incomplete, very sparse. So to to make the most sense out of them, we need to perform imputation, and and I will. I described that step uh, in more detail uh, in further slides. Uh, they're very high dimensional data, very noisy, and, and we need to make all efforts to, to re clean them up and, and uh, uh, generate more low dimensional representations of, of this data. Um, and the many of the, uh, one of the main challenges with the single cell RNA-seq data is to annotate this data and, and uh, understand what kind of cell uh, we're, we're dealing with. So to do many of these steps, we're uh, using a lot of machine learning tools. One of them uh, is called single cell variational inference of our SCVI, which is a deep, deep generative neural net uh, to, that, that we're uh, uh, successfully uh, uh, using to, to address many of these challenges. One aspect due to the high dimension of, of these data is that they take a lot of time to, to analyze. And they really, as I mentioned before, where we're talking about hundreds of billions of data points, so that, that really takes, can take hours for some of our bigger data sets. This is a problem because when we want to iterate over the analysis uh, for, for various reasons, we were, we were spending a lot of time just waiting for, for the, that analysis to be done. So one could ask why, why not use faster methods? Uh, well, so we're using uh, the, the, the fastest me methods that we can and are using GPU uh, accelerated uh, 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 methods for, for the analysis, but it's still taking uh, hours. We could also, uh, one could ask why we're not using uh, uh, approximation methods, uh, and we are, right? so the variational inference is, uh, 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 it's that, that we're using is, is uh, one of these approximation methods that could speed up the analysis. So the, the solution that we've uh, found is to uh, uh, perform online, online learning. So typically when, when, one, when one would analyze these data, they would uh, take all of these data and analyze them at the, the same time, uh, train uh, the, the model on all the data and generate one, one model and, and, and use that. And when you would get more data, you would uh, generate a new model. So that doesn't really work for us because every time the biologists uh, who want to interpret this data, when they would look at them, if they, they uh, uh, were looking at different plots or different representations of these data, they would have to uh, retrain the, the way they, or like re, uh, uh, reinterpret the, 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 these plots over and over again each time there are new samples. Uh, it also takes a lot of time. So, the way we're circumventing this, this challenge is by performing online learning where we're uh, tweaking the model with the new samples as we receive them, as we uh, analyze them, and in a way that does not change entirely the, the, uh, the shape of this data downstream and enables the biologists to uh, look at or, or remain familiar with the same plots that they were looking at. So putting this into a, a visualization, I've uh, uh, represented here the, the three steps of, of uh, the, the uh, uh, online learning process, where on the left, uh, this is a, a TSNI representation of the data, which is a 2D 
representation of the entire gene expression matrix where each dot represents a cell. Uh, and just to simplify, it's been clustered into four or four groups, which can be uh, uh, interpreted as four or four cell types. Uh, and so we would typically fit, fit the, the, the core data uh, overnight uh, or, or on a, a, a infrequent basis uh, to get a, a t a, not only a, a model of the data, but also a Disney representation of it. Uh, and then when we get more samples, we can simply project the additional cells on, onto this uh, same model. Uh, and, and at the bottom is, is uh, uh, what is depicted is the, the, uh, the confident confidence in the projection of these, uh, these samples, uh, these, these cells, sorry. But sometimes when there are new cells that the model was not trained with, uh, uh, a new cell type, they're, they're, these uh, cells would be projected with low confidence. Uh, and so we can, we can detect this, and that's when we would trigger a re retraining of the, the model. And so we would refit the, the model using the, the new samples. And uh, uh, as you can see on the right, the, the, the red cluster is uh, uh, a, a new cell type projected onto a TISNI representation that is consistent with, wh with what we have had before. So we were able to refit, the, the retrain the model incorporating a new cell type that the model had not been trained with before and still projected onto uh, a, a TISNI plot that, that uh, preserved the, 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 shape, the, the, the prior shape. Uh, putting that into a, a, a workflow very simply when we receive uh, uh, new uh, data, we can, when we receive data, we can fit the model and, and uh, uh, when there's a, an extension to the data, meaning new samples, we would check whether there's low confidence of the projection, uh, projection of the new cells or if there's a new, new cell type, then we would uh, refit the data. The data. One, uh, so the, the single cell variational inference uh, algorithm that I discussed before is able to do um, multiple aspects of the analysis, such as the normalization, batch correction, but also the imputation. An imputation of single cell RNA-seq data, which is extremely sparse, is, is very important. Uh, and it can really tremendously help with the, the interpretation. Uh, one uh, representation or illustration of, of this uh, uh, imputation step or, or clean, clean up of the data is, is represented here. So again, this is a, a TISNI plot uh, of a, a particular sample that we analyzed and there are four genes that I'm representing here with, at the top is the raw data and at the bottom is the imputed data. As you can uh, perhaps appreciate, the, the top row is uh, pretty sparse and noisy, but the bottom one uh, is much cleaner and one gets much more of a sense of which clusters or which uh, subgroups of cells that the genes are expressed in. And this allows to uh, perform much easier the uh, interpretation of which cell types we're looking at with uh, uh, PTPRC on the left, identifying all immune cells, uh, and then further uh, genes such as uh, J-chain identifying plasma cells and CD3D identifying T cells and BANK1 uh, identifying B cells. And so using these uh, what we call marker genes were able to interpret uh, which which cell types were uh, were were looking at, but this is this has been uh, traditionally a very rate limiting step in single cell analysis, and one uh, needs to uh, automate this process in order to be able to perform it mo uh, over and over again, and not having one analyst uh, interpret uh, each single data set manually every time. So we've been working on a framework to uh, perform this cell type annotation step automatically. And uh, as I've uh, started mentioning, that the, the problem with uh, uh, prior approaches is that it w or for, for single cell annotation was that it was first uh, building on the knowledge that one had seen that, in that cell type before and, and relying on the existence of a particular signature. Uh, when uh, dealing with new data of a, of a uh, new type of chemistry, for example, the exact genes that are, that are expressed are not exactly the same, and so the, the, the prior gene signatures might, might not work as well. Uh, and also when we're looking at cell types that one didn't have a, a signature for, it, it would be very complicated to, to identify them automatically. 
So the framework that we've, uh, that we've put together is, is able to perform these tasks uh, uh, all together. Uh, it's relying not only on, on prior lists of, uh, of gene expression signatures, but it's also able to, to recognize when there's a, a cell type that it didn't have a, a, a signature for. Uh, and uh, as opposed to other algorithms that can assign uh, uh, labels without some sense of the probability of, of the cells uh, being of a particular cell type here, it's really it's the, the output is, is a cell type probability, which has many, many advantages. Um, so uh, very briefly, it's, it's based on uh, a, a uh, diffusion map representation of the expression data uh, for which we're uh, building a graph of, of the, the distances of, of all the, the, the cells in that space. And for each cell, we're, or sorry, for each diffusion component, we're annotating the, the boundaries of the diffusion component. Uh, uh, annotating them using the, the, sing the, sorry, the cell type signatures that we have in our possession, and then uh, assigning a probability of, of each cell being of that particular type. So uh, simply represented here, if we had three cell types in that, that data set, stromal cells, myeloid cells, and, and T cells, and where we would annotate the, the three boundaries of, of uh, the, the, the cells in, in that space, if we're looking at, at cell two, uh, it would have a higher uh, uh, probability of being a myeloid cell than, than a, a stromal cell. So, and we do, do that for every cell in the data set so as to have a probability for each cell to be of, of uh, uh, each cell type. Um, taking that, that idea a, a bit further, we're starting from uh, a database of, of signatures for, for all cells. Uh, that, that we know of. Uh, of course, one, the traditional way of representing cell types was in a sort of lineage, cell lineage hierarchy, but one, we, we know now that this is not truly the case. Everything is very fluid and there's not a clear separation between cell types. Nonetheless, it's a good starting point to, to have these cell signatures uh, in, in a database. We're using them to assign probabilities of, of each cell type, as I've mentioned in a previous slide. But then we're sort of retraining our database of, um, uh, of, of existing sig cell signatures by using the current data we're analyzing to, to re-derive a, a list of, of markers that are optimized for the particular data set that we're looking at. Uh, which could be uh, highly influenced by the, the type of experimental, experimental procedures or the type of tissue that we're looking at. So it's important to, to re-optimize our signatures as, as we go. And that is uh, 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 fed back into the, the, the database. And this allows us to not only uh, optimize the, this cell calling step as we accumulate more data, as we're uh, uh, looking at more uh, tissue types and as we're looking into more more diseases. So it's been ex an extremely important step for us to, to uh, uh, streamline this, this step of the single cell annotation data. So in conclusion, I would like to uh, thank uh, multiple people. First of all, the patients and their families. As I've mentioned, we're analyzing thousands of, of tissue samples and each sample comes from a patient who made the choice to uh, allow us to, to look at their, their uh, uh, biopsy for advancing science and drug discovery. Uh, the Celsius Therapeutics team uh, is that, that uh, uh, has been working on the data that I've presented is a, a very talented group of, of people. Uh, there's uh, um, the work of people in the single cell genomics team that I've, that I've presented, they've uh, been uh, making tremendous advances in, in the, the single cell genomics uh, field. And also I would like to acknowledge the entire data science team. In particular, uh, Greg DeMaris, who has uh, been establishing our AWS and data engineering uh, uh, pipeline, uh, and Noah Spies and Tommy Boucher, who have been working on computational biology and machine learning approaches. Thank you.